Trying to understand dissociation can feel like a very complicated thing. It can feel like an impossible task, just trying to mend together all the different components of who you are. Maybe you don't have dissociative identity disorder, but perhaps you have something similar like dissociative amnesia or some kind of dissociative state where you black out, you have a hard time remembering certain things, and you know your childhood is just really murky. It's nebulous for you. You can't grasp it. Over the past 14 years of my career, I have heard so many different examples of dissociation to, to where I recognize, now that I'm a little bit more experienced in my career in this area, that we need to talk about it in a way that's going to help us not only grasp the idea of the different fragments of who we are as humans, but also to help you heal. What I know as a psychotherapist, as a medical provider, is very different from what you know as a lay person or as someone who's seeking information. So in today's video, I'm going to highlight a couple of things of dissociative identity disorder and different forms of dissociation so that you can be aware of different ways to heal this and so that you can do this on your own. But before we jump in, let me briefly introduce myself in case you're new. My name is Tamara. I'm an internationally and board certified trauma therapist. I'm licensed in mental health and I specialize in treating children, teens and families as well as adults who are dealing with trauma. Let's go ahead and jump in. So I may have mentioned this in one of my previous videos on the topic, but I'm going to mention it again here. Dissociation is basically a Latin word meaning severed parts. It's, it's really the process of trying to, um, um, navigate the fragmented pieces and bits and pieces of who you are and it really um, tries to define the word dissociation really tries to define what that experience is like it's like separating from reality detaching from reality and it's putting you in a different sort of mind you may also find that being in that different place in your mind or, or different um, set of mind really is a protective mechanism. It helps you to defend against anything that can be perceived by the amygdala, by the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the hippocampus as a threat. I talk about this a lot on the channel that the amygdala is like the, it is the emotional center of the brain. And it's like a flashlight that really seeks around trying to find what's going on. And the, the amygdala really has no higher order thinking. In other words, it has no ability to process logically what is going on, what's the best approach, how you should perceive something. The amygdala is very primitive. It reacts, it responds to anything in the environment that its flashlight may shine on. And so that is why you might find yourself dissociating at moments where there isn't necessarily a traumatic threat, but there's some kind of threat there that your amygdala perceives, whether that's confrontation with someone, tension in the environment, maybe every time you go to work, you feel some kind of emotional um, strain, you feel a little bit overwhelmed, the amygdala is going to react to that and you may find yourself dissociating as a result. Now, before we get into what are the different ways that psychotherapists try to heal dissociation, let me kind of get you to do an activity with me that may be helpful. I encourage you to get a piece of paper and a pen, okay? Get a piece of paper and a pen. And what I want you to do is draw a line down the middle of your page. I want you to write two things on both sides of that line, okay? So on the left side, you're gonna write down something like my dissociation my dissociation on the right side you want to write down how i come back okay and if i had paper i would actually do this technique with you but i don't think i do so oh no so what I want you to do is get a piece of paper and follow along with me. I'm gonna take you through a technique that may be really helpful to you. So you're gonna want a piece of paper and you're also gonna want a marker or a pen. 
Now on your paper, and I'm actually gonna do this with you because I think sometimes if I lead you by doing it myself, um, I think it will feel a little less intimidating. So let's do it together. So what you wanna do on your piece of paper, you wanna put a line down the middle of your page, okay? Just like this, this is all you want, very simple. On the left side, you're gonna write down my dissociation, okay? My dissociation. On the right side of the page, you're gonna write down what brings me back, okay? And we're just gonna explore what this looks like for you. And so here's what you're looking at. Okay, one side, my dissociation. The other side is what brings me back. So on the my dissociation side, go ahead and list at least five things that kind of proves to you and other people that you're dissociating. So what are those situations that you dissociate in? I'll give you a couple of mine, okay? I'll embarrass myself for you. Uh, the first thing that I do when I'm dissociating, okay? It's a little slightly personal, but it's not at the same time. It's when I'm showering. So when I go home and I work out, okay? I'm actually dissociating in that workout moment. Why? Because I have my earphones on, I'm doing some really intense aerobics activity or strength cha training or conditioning where I'm listening to the music, I'm actually focusing on what the lyrics are saying, or I'm actually focusing on the tune of the music, and I'm focusing on really conditioning my muscles and building my strength and toning up. By the time I'm done with that 45 minute workout, I take my earphones off and it's like, boom, back into reality again. So let me explain how this goes. So I'm gonna put under my dissociation, my exercise routine. Okay, so my exercise routine, what brings me back from that dissociative moment where I'm so in tuned and engulfed in what I'm doing that I can't really focus on what's around me is when 45 minutes on my watch starts beeping, right? Or the music stops and then that's like my click back into reality. So I'm gonna put under the what brings me back, I'm gonna say time, bell of my watch, okay? And the other thing would be the music stops. And then I know at that time that, okay, it's time to click back into reality. My dissociative 45 minutes is over. If we wanna do a different one, I'm gonna give you another experience where I dissociate. So years ago when I worked in a group private practice, I had just um, resigned from a very hard, very traumatic position where um, I was working with kids who lived on a campus. They, they had a lot of severe issues. The families were dysfunctional. There was a lot of sexual abuse, a lot of um, trauma, childhood trauma. Um, I would have to watch the kids get restrained on the campus. I mean, it was a horrible experience, so I resigned. After two years, I couldn't take it. I accepted a position in a private practice where there were group therapists and I was one of the youngest ones there actually. So what I would do at the end of the day is I would get in my car, I had at least an hour drive back home. At my age now, I don't know what I was thinking because I can't do that now, but I would get in my car and I would drive an hour home. So here's how I would dissociate. So I would turn up the music and I would drive the highway. On this highway, there were no stops. There were no toll roads, none of that. All I had to do was follow the exit signs or follow the, the, the markings on the road. By the time I would make it to 10 minutes before I got to my home, I had to stop at a red light before I turned up the hill to get to my house. So it was about maybe, let's say I left my work seven o'clock, I got home 7.50, and the next 10 minutes would be, right there would be a red light and I know I'm home. So what would snap me out of my dissociative state would be that red light. That's the only thing that brought me out of the dissociative state. And I would get to that red light and think to myself, what did I pass? Like, what were the landmarkings? What did I, did I stop at a stop sign? What, you know, I don't have dissociative identity disorder. I don't have any kind of dissociative disorders. I don't have PTSD. What I was experiencing at the time was burnout and compassion fatigue because that whole day of trauma that I would experience in this group private practice really did weigh on me. And so the only way that my amygdala 
the only way that the executive parts of my brain, the frontal lobes, could manage what I had dealt with throughout that day was to dissociate. So I encourage you to make a whole list for yourself. There are a lot of people who dissociate in sexual activity. There are a lot of people who in that moment do not really communicate with their partner. There's no conversation. There's no awareness. There's like this this uh, subconscious kind of participation, right? Then you may feel yourself coming back to reality in a way that is kind of scary. Other people dissociate during childbirth. There are some parents I've had come into therapy because they know that they were there on the operating table. They know they got a C-section. They know they did natural birth, but they can't remember the whole episode of all the processes before the baby came out, right? Um, another example of dissociation may be uh, getting in the shower, sitting down on the floor, letting the shower run, and just kind of dissociating in that way, right? And the only thing that snaps you into reality is the cold water. The hot water is running out and you feel the cold water on your body. That's the only click that says, okay, get back into reality. Now let's start talking about the serious pieces. Of dissociation. Dissociative identity disorder, dissociative amnesia, and post-traumatic stress, even adjustment disorder, all has some element of dissociation in it. Now, dissociative identity disorder, I want you to see this on a spectrum, that that is the highest part of the spectrum. So let's say dissociation, you know, bits and pieces of dissociating while driving home, that's really on the mild end. Dissociating and you can't remember anything, that's more moderate. And dissociative identity disorder, Disorder is at the top which is severe and extreme of that spectrum okay so we all dissociate but we're on a spectrum and it depends on what part of that spectrum you are on that determines how much this is going to impact you you know if you have dissociative identity disorder you are likely to experience dissociation frequently and this is where we get into how to fix this how to treat this now there is something you can download off the internet. It's a PDF. You can download what's called the Dissociative Experiences Scale. Dissociative Experiences Scale. I'll try to post something in the description box for you down below so that you can see what this is. But here's how it goes. So you answer all the questions on the Dissociative Experiences Scale. And in this scale, you're really, you're going to be circling percentages. And, you know, at the end of that, you want to tally all your answers up. If you get a 40%, that means that you have clinically significant dissociation, uh, you know, symptoms. 40%. If you get a 40%, you have clinically significant symptoms, okay? Anything below that is really just you know, a, a score that says, hey, let's shine a spotlight on this. If you get a 40%, I suggest that you see a psychotherapist because there's something going on there that you need to research. The next thing is what's known as Frazier's Dissociative Table. Now here's where we get into the meat of this video. It has a series of techniques that a psychotherapist would use to understand your dissociation. Let's start with the first one. The first one is known as the spotlight technique. Here we go right here on the screen, the spotlight technique. Now, here's really what this means. That the, the, the client and the psychotherapist is shining a spotlight on the altar or the fragmented part of you that seems to understand what is going on. The, the technique, spotlight technique, is really shining a flashlight on that part of you or that altar or that fragmented piece of you that is participating in the treatment. I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of an image. It's like having all your different dissociated fragmented pieces of yourself line up. What the, the therapist and the client is going to do is shine the flashlight on that one part of you that seems to be willing, I'm gonna say, and able to participate in treatment. The next thing is known as the middle man technique. Here it is on the screen. Is basically the idea that one particular altar um, is able to speak up for the for the others, right? Or one fragmented part or piece of you is able to speak up for all the other fragmented pieces of you. It's like, 
you know, looking for the, the mediator in this situation, looking for the one that has the most confidence or the one who is going to step out in front and, you know, really participate in the treatment process. So a psychotherapist who is using the middleman technique will rely on the altar, on the part, on the fragmented piece of you who seems to be most present, maybe protecting the others. Maybe it's a fragmented piece of, of this person that is able to kind of make sense out of things and participate in treatment because he or she is stronger okay so that's called the middleman technique now the next technique is is known as the search for the center ego and the whole idea for this is you know who's mainly in charge here right it's finding that fragmented piece that alter that part that is the one who's mainly in charge you know um, this is a part fragmented piece an alter that may be a little bit more confident maybe a little bit more in control and has the ability to kind of step out and give the therapist and the client, you know, some kind of strength to understand or some clarification on what happened to cause the trauma. I know that was a lot. Let me break that down. So basically so the, the search for the center ego is the therapist and client's um, search for finding the most dominant, the strongest and the most confident part or fragmented piece of the person so that that piece or fragment can then participate in treatment so we're going to figure out who is the who is the um the, the strongest one the most confident one the one who is able to function the one who is able to be strongest and speak up on behalf of the others the next is known as memory projection memory projection here's what happened memory projection is you know basically you know it's one part or fragment or one i'm gonna say alter i'm gonna add that in here that is able to recall memories it's that one part that is able to help the client and the therapist understand the traumatic memory okay it really is um, I'm going to say it's like a, a process of picking up the right cards at the right time, you know, and somebody who's way more experienced than me in treating dissociative identity disorder or somebody who has actually dedicated their entire career to this would be able to explain to you that this is really like a, a chess game. It's really like dominoes. It's really like a flashcard game. You have to figure out what pieces of the fragmented person is able to participate in different parts of treatment. You know, let's say you have Tommy, Billy, and Kimberly that's living on the inside of you. Billy doesn't want to remember anything. So we're going to have to go to Kimberly who is able to pull those memories up and really participate in the treatment process. We may also have to call on Michael. That's another fragmented piece, you know, of the puzzle. We may have to call on Michael, who can then be the middleman and be the one who's going to navigate this, balance things out, and, you know, really provide that information for all the other alters or personalities or fragmented pieces. It's a lot to digest, but we have a couple more steps to go. The next is fusion and integration. Fusion and integration. Now here's what's going on here. Frazier, um, who is the uh, individual who came up with the dissociative table, which includes all of these different techniques I'm talking about, he basically was a, is a you know pretty big supporter, I could say, of, of fusion and integration. Um, I really do think he felt that that was the best place to be. A lot of people nowadays feel like, no, it's not. I don't want to integrate. I don't want to fuse all my selves, all my different fragmented pieces, because I like that of myself. I like the fact that I can change. I like the different parts of we, of us, so to speak. And so some people are against fusion and integration. But Fraser basically said this, fusion and integration is the state by which we take all these fragmented pieces of who you are, all these fragmented pieces that engages into Association that has become protective for you and a defense mechanism. We want to fuse them together so that they all become one and they all become a cohesive piece of one person. And for me, uh, you know, 
especially starting out in my career, I thought this was the ultimate goal, but there are a lot of people today who are now saying they don't want to fuse those different fragmented pieces. They want to, to be that split off person. They want to be able to experience different things, you know, um, and be able to, to kind of wear different hats. And, and, you know, it's like, there's a, there's a baby living in you. There's a, 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 a really, you know, confident woman living in you. There's, there's another person living in you that's quite seductive, but classy. And, you know, there's another person that's living in you who is really good at being the tomboy, you know? So all of these different fragmented pieces, you know, they need to be integrated according to Fraser. But in today's world, there are a lot of people who are saying, I actually like these different pieces of who I am. Difficult. Um, I think this video is long for a reason. This is a huge topic. I will come back at some point to give you a little bit more information of how these techniques work and kind of give you some insight on, you know, what's going on in the treatment process. Next video, I'm going to give you some tips on how to manage all kinds of dissociation, not just dissociative identity disorder, but dissociative amnesia, blacking out, zoning out, all of that. So stay tuned. So thank you so much for being with me in today's video, guys. Go ahead and give this video a thumbs up if it was helpful and hit that subscribe button if you wanna to continue to get videos like this. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.